thanks and thank you for having me here. Um, to be honest, like when I uh, prepared my presentation, I was uh, I prepared it with a way of um, talking to total Haskell experts, and so I had kept it really short. And, um, so now we had the you know, little uh, practice session, so I thought we're expanding a bit. Um, so before I get into the talk, I thought probably talking a little bit about me to set the background. Um, I'm, I'm German and I um, started uh, with basically Python and um, web apps in Germany and came over to Australia based on that. And during my um, um, university time, I also um, started with free software, and that's uh, where it brought me to GIMP project. Um, not for coding, really, but for documentation, since that was sort of the easiest way of contributing back without knowing how to write code so much. Um, but what I basically ended up with on the Python realm was um, on this old side of Python. And um, the Zoop and GIMP projects are kind of significant here because um, there were uh, two bases on my motivation why I want to try a Haskell. So to kind of give a picture, I felt with Zoop, with Python in general, um, we always felt that uh, for every code check-in, you provide a, a, a set of tests so you know that your code works, right? Um, oddly enough, when I reflected that on the GIMP project, um, there are no tests at all. So they ship the product basically, they ship GIMP with almost no tests. And um, as I want to explain a little bit through the talk, um, I think I reflected on that when I was starting with Haskell. And I think, whereas it's debatable if it's a good practice or not, um, there were some reasons why they were actually being able to ship GIMP without any tests at all. Which brings me actually to the question why I want to try Haskell. And there were basically like three main points um, why I want to try Haskell or why I try Haskell. Um, and then the first and foremost point for me, I felt um, that I didn't grok or understand the language at all back in uni. Like, um, we had AI in uni and um, we started out with Haskell implementing a few search algorithms, Haskell and Haskell, and um, while our prof was a big fan of Haskell, mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no understand, like I just understood object on the programming, right? And then you know object on the pro or you think you know object on programming, and then someone talks about functions and it, how you can compose them and, and apply them, and, and it's so cool, and you think like, where are all my objects? And <laughs> it's, it, yeah, so I really had a hard time, and I felt like using Xcoded as a window manager, which is a tiling window manager, I really want to understand the language because, um, well, I'll come to that in a uh, separate slide. And what I already um, started explaining, the more I, the more I started into the programming, professional programming job, the more I started wondering why we in Python projects write so, so many tests and GIMP sort of ships its products without any tests at all. So, by definition, that, that shouldn't work, right? So, as I explained, Xmode is a highly window manager, and I've, since starting, I started with Ivan 3, and 
when I switched over to XML. Uh, to be honest, I didn't do it for the language, but rather it had excellent documentation on how to get started and set up. But the problem is that you're writing um, configuration code in Haskell. And that's sort of a pain because you always look it up and it works, it sometimes works, and I have no, no idea of why it actually works or not. So that, that was kind of a pain. But I still kept using it. I, I found it wonderful, so, but I had no idea on how to really configure it and understand it. And the other thing was, for as I explained, that back in university, I had no, uh, no idea. And um, still, I kept using XNORED. And it kept nagging me that there is something I'm using, and I have no idea of how it works, and, and how I configure it, how I use it, really. And the other thing was kind of tapes, type safety Haskell brings. Um, uh, just when I reflected on that we were writing a lot of tests for our code uh, in Python, that um, in GIM, um, I felt like, Hang on a minute. Um, while C is probably a very old language and perhaps not comparable uh, to the type safetyness or the type system in Pascal, yet they do have a compiler, and the compiler tells them at least if there are problems with the types and location functions. So there must be a correlation between um, building at least the program, you being able to uh, build the program and and um, uh, proving that your, your program works correctly. The other nice thing, what I kind of learned in the object-oriented world, that inheritance can be really a pain in the butt. And composition is actually the thing you want to go for. So the nice thing with Haskell, or proclaimed nice thing with Haskell functions is that composition is good for you. And understandability, um, I'm sort of like a big pearl here now, but I do write or have to do with pearl code, so um, pearl is sometimes um, less understandable uh, due to the um, weird way of invocations and many ways of how you can invoke the language. Where Haskell in the first, like in the first one, if, if you look at Haskell code, it's hard to understand because of your ignorance. But once you understand the syntax, it becomes very concise and meaningful. And I guess understandably can be translated in the functional real more of that you can better reason about your programs. So, back to university. Um, what I've tried was basically uh, learn you a Haskell uh, as the first instance. And I felt it was quite mathematical um, and abstract. So perhaps people will disagree, but um, to a certain level, it was the same with the 99 Haskell problems. You know, it's it's kind of good that you can sort of understand how you use lists, and the more you understand them, obviously, the more you can apply uh, different methodologies on how you solve your your day-to-day -day problems. But I felt like I want to have something which I can start applying in in a real day-to-day. -day project and and go from there and then challenge my, my, myself with, with, with new problems. So that's basically where um, Fraser came in because um, I kind of, I didn't give up on Haskell but I kind of put it away and, and um, uh, Fraser joined Red Hat and he was talking about Haskell and that's why I felt, hey, Learning. There's another chance of learning Haskell. So we did the SIS 194 course, um, and I felt 
really great because it also had homework and it allowed you in that homework to start um, applying what you've learned in the lecture. But because the, the professor already provided some sample code, it gave you the quick win of actually starting off and, and doing something fancy. So all you need is, is kind of a, a little push and, and you were able to sort of uh, run with it. Um, so the takeaways basically from SIS 194, I felt it's a, it's a very nice course in terms of doing something practical. So writing a JSON uh, parser in Homework 3 is something um, you start off with because someone else already provides you with some ground framework and, and you can start learning from that. Um, the only tricky part on the Sys Online course, and that's maybe what they've already changed, is that I got confused a little bit with um, Monis versus Monoids. Um, so the lecture was basically about monoids, but in the lecture he already talked, he also talked about basic input output. And that's where you wonder, okay, monoids is something that has something to do with input output, but then you figure out, oh, hang on a minute, monoids is something completely different, it has nothing to do with, mon with monoids. So that's why I got a bit uh, hung up. Um, so I felt confident after the course, um, but obviously with everything, applying what you have learned is much more difficult than actually um, uh, just taking it on board and, and, and running with it. Um, I actually see that a lot of people stop squinting because it's so small, is it? Do I, maybe I can make it bigger? I had no way to fix that last time. Well, All right, okay. Then I'm not <laughs> Reveal stop. doesn't scale as much as it should to a big screen. <laughs> so, with the equipment of Sys194, I started hacking on Xmobile. And Xmobile is basically a little um, status monitor you have on the top or the bottom of the screen, like a panel. And the nice thing about Xmobile is it, it's completely text-based and you can configure it with Haskell code. Um, and you can hook in uh, the plugins Xmobile provides. Um, so what I've written for myself due to the fact that I knew more about Python than Haskell were uh, a few scripts um, which basically run as plugins, but it irked me all the time that it's not Haskell code. It should be a plugin, right? So what I felt like now down here in Australia, and what do you need to know when you go out? You need to know what the UV rating is, right? <laughs> and due to the fact that um, the um, Australian, uh, uh, I don't know, I only know the short name of Panza, they provide this uh, nice um, XML feed. Um, which is um, hardly um, an XML valid, but they provide it. They provide the data um, over the day, and uh, um, you should be able to take it and pause it and, and show if the UV rating is you know, hazardous. <laughs> should put in a UV suit, or uh, if you can you know, walk out without any work, slip, slop, slap. Um, so I've made screenshots now. Um, to sort of like prove the case in point. So that's basically showing over time um, the UV rating from the Panzer. And um, you wouldn't actually be able to see the difference between my Python script and, and uh, the um, Haskell plugin. Um, but after the Sys194 course, um, I was able to understand the basics of Haskell. Um, and with pattern matching and understanding Monad, 
code and and being able to understand what is posted online equipped me with the possibility to actually write my own plugin. So obviously hacking is much easier than uh, writing your your own code and, and start it from scratch. So by being able to understand what people post online and and you know, what I've learned from Sys 194, it, it led me to a way to implement that plugin. It's not accepted yet, but um, since the author wants me to try using Parsec for parsing XML, but um, yeah. So there were obviously pitfalls with this whole thing. Um, you're not starting off and just writing off a plugin, obviously. Um, Fraser always helped me. Um, so one thing what you, what you shouldn't be doing is uh, creating irrefutable patterns. Uh, so I saw that somewhere else where someone just assigned or well, bound with a let statement um, the just value or the, the right value of an either. And I thought, hey, that's cool. I want to do that too. Why should I just care about the arrow case, right? But that's why you have it. So, um, and that code basically just took text and passed it in the XML document. Um, and if it was successful, it gave you the document. And uh, the other case, well, shouldn't happen, right? Um, and the reason why I didn't stumble, or the comp compiler didn't scream at me uh, about this irrefutable pattern is that I uh, didn't use capital to just compile my, my plugin that I used to run Haskell. Um, to be honest, I don't know <coughs> if Rand Haskell is just the old school way of compiling Haskell code, or it's just, again, why it's there, but Rand Haskell sort of brought me where I wanted to be with the plugin, and until I saw the XML bar screaming at me, and then they are, the, the, there was a pause error that I thought, well, okay, maybe it's not that. <laughs> But you know the plugin works now, and, and uh, I can use it day to day. And uh, hopefully, if I jump over that parser hurdle, then I might be able to uh, ship it with the next X mobile release. But that uh, that obviously isn't the end. I mean, if you learn a new language, you want to apply it constantly. And I felt like that I actually a, a colleague taught me into doing a course of our course algorithms too, and I felt like. Hey, I'm awesome, I can do that in Haskell. <laughs> but the problem is like, the course for our course starts off uh, with imperative languages and implements everything there. So there are some interesting findings of trying to um, move that uh, ideology into the functional realm. So the first lesson was about graphs, and I felt like, hey, graphs, I did that a little bit with Python, but so it should be straightforward. And the first um, uh, items of the API were really straightforward, and I was even able to translate that into the functional idea. But the more we went into the search algorithms with breadth first search was the first one, the more I actually felt strongly. Um, and one of the reasons was that um, you need a kind of stateful code for the breadth first search. The breadth first search uses a stack, whereas the breadth first search uses a queue. And due to the fact that the functional languages have immutable data structures, you would have, and perhaps there are other ways to solve it, but you would have ended up with uh, doing an operation, getting the uh, the new data structure out of which is the queue, and then constantly reapplying um, a different operations on the queue, which is NQ and DQ. And it was like I really struggled with my little knowledge of Haskell. Mm. Okay, that's on the slide. Um, but. Obviously, not giving up, I started off um, searching the internet and uh, found the state motor. 
And I felt like, hey, state monad, monads, that's the thing with the do, exp uh, a do expression. So in bind and return, I could use that. Um, interesting thing about state monad is what I found out was that most of the code examples are actually referring to an older version of the state monad. And the interface has changed. So I found on the Haskell wiki where they uh, explain the primitives of the state monad with put and get. So the nice thing about the state monad is it's still purely functional. But you can almost treat it as an imperative program of um, running operations against your data structure. So if you think about a for loop in an imperative programming language where the where you have the um, the iterator value, which is usually i or something, uh, constantly incremented. In a similar way, uh, you can use the state monad. Um, uh, it's a bit hard to see, but my solution I basically ended up with is um, uh, and in breadth-first search, you have to basically enqueue uh, unvisited um, nodes and dequeue um, these nodes later on. So uh, composing that into diff different uh, functions, as I've indicated before, leaves you with maybe a where construct where you have to shuffle around the, the new um, queue uh, into other uh, functions, whereas with the state mode, I can uh, run the NQ and DQ in one function, and the state mode or the run state function provides me back with the changed queue without assigning and or, or binding and uh, mm -hmm. rebinding the queue again. As you can imagine, while uh, probably uh, some experienced Haskell programmers. Probably uh, uh, thinking, what is he talking about? Uh, maybe some of you also think, what is what I'm talking about? But it's like for me as a beginner, it's actually quite hard to explain my code. Um, um, so basically, that's where I went up with with the course or course, and I'm still continuing doing it because uh, the cool thing with the course it um, it allows me or it challenges me to. Um, to think about the solutions in a purely functional way and um, due to the um, immutability, immutability of data structures that's, uh, that's quite challenging. Uh, but I also have future ideas than just finding the course. I wrote a small Python program since uh, I read about how to debug pro programs in a meaningful way. And what I stumbled over in that book was uh, the talk about uh, slicing programs. And what it basically lets you um, do is a, a slice of a program is a subset of the instructions uh, with non-dependent code lines removed. And when I started writing and reading about that, I was going through swaths of uh, Python code since uh, my colleagues were not so experienced with Python and you ended up with huge methods doing 5,000 things in one, one, one method and, and reasoning about that, uh, or about those methods, is, is really hard. So I felt like I needed a tool to do that. And that's why I ended up with a program slice, a Python program, which allows me to do that. Uh, it's not very elaborate, but it sort of uh, gets me halfway there. Um, so having all that, I thought um, talking about uh, basically two take-home lessons I took from the, uh, the course and applying it in, in real life. And that was, yeah, theory was applying the information you learn online. It's you know, challenging and hard. And 
one other thing I experienced with Haskell functions is, especially during the course, um, if you write if you write uh, functional uh, if you write functional code and functions, you obviously breaking them down into separate pieces. You can later on piece together and, and gives you, due to the composition, a quite nice program. Now, sometimes, and maybe that's because of the inheritance of uh, imperative languages, where you can actually do that, whereas in functional languages, uh, writing huge uh, functions is actually really hard. So when you approach a problem and try to encode it in um, a function in Haskell or a functional language, and you're struggling because you want to do so many things, then uh, I always felt you haven't broken down the problem correctly. So um, trying to think about it again and separate the meaningful bit usually allows you to end up probably with a few functions, but they do a really core cool thing, and I think that's the whole essence of functional programming. Um, I'm actually already getting to the end of my talk, so yeah. thanks to Fraser for teaching me last school, and thanks for speaking here. Um, questions welcome, and uh, thanks for listening. Actually, I did it in 15 minutes, and people are like, oh, I actually didn't tell you, it's 45 minutes to the time. <laughs> so I had to stretch a little bit. Yeah. Are there any questions? Do you, if you were going to do it all again, would you not do Learn Your Haskell first and go straight into Sys194, or did that help you a little bit, having that theoretical basis? It's quite hard to tell, because I'm not sure what I took away from, um, from the Learn Your Haskell, but I think I would go for the Sys194. Yeah. I guess it works differently for everybody, so yeah. if one doesn't yeah. work for you, try the other one. And I find I'm quite a visual thinker, Yeah. so for me doing the abstract mathematical stuff sometimes doesn't work for me to understand the concept. Yeah. Um, that's why I also struggled with most of the other tutorials I found on the net, so 99 Haskell problems. And yep. So perhaps 99 Haskell problems is more like a practice thing rather than learning Haskell, but the Learndria uh, Haskell um, I've found is, is more is trickier, especially learning the concept of you know, that's a value and um, you have immutable data types and Yep. So some of the core concepts I find that CS, CIS 195 is yeah, teaching better than than um, yeah, yep. that's cool. yeah. You mentioned that the you know figuring out the state mana is kind of an aha thing. Mm. Um, can you think of any uh, like the opposite moments where it was like it's something you never really worked out or? Where you were frustrated with the whole way through, and you still haven't, still haven't quite come to terms with it. Uh, Chingley, well, it's it's also hard to tell since I'm just starting off with Haskell. Right? But Chingley, I'm I'm thinking of uh, implementing the function for finding out connected components in an undirected graph, and um, again translating that into the functional world where you basically throw uh, data structures with constant time access away, but it seems to be you're focusing more on the laziness. Uh, it's actually hard to trans, you know, like obviously you can't translate one on one, but thinking of a good way of translating is, is I think the hard part of what I'm struggling with. And with the connected components, I've, I've found an algorithm, but it's, not as good as what is uh, being teach in the course, so that's why I still have to fiddle with it. And usually the monads and the bind thing, that's what I'm still struggling with. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what I mean with applying it. Like I, I thought I understood the theory that you have bind and you can chain monads and stuff. 
like that. But then actually writing it, it's like, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Crash into it. Uh, if there are no more questions. Cool.